Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. Here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Meaning as he takes you on a chapter by chapter, verse by verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Hey, we're going to start a new book today. There are only two books in God's Word named after women. We're going to do one of them today called the Book of Ruth. Ruth means um, a female friend. It means beautiful. And let's just shorten it down to that. It simply means beautiful. And no doubt she was a beautiful woman. Um, she was a Moabitist. And it's important, and as much as you're going to find her in the genealogy of Christ, that you need to know definitely who were the Moabites. And naturally, they're of the same family as Abraham. They're of Abraham's seed. By that I mean his brothers, so to speak, because it was his nephew, Lot, that would be the father of, of uh, Moab, which Simply the word Moab means of his own father. So what we have here is one of the remnant that escaped because of righteousness, Sodom and Gomorrah. So if being of the Adamic seed, which God kept that pure from the Adamic seed, through which would come Christ, not of the six-day creation, but the eighth-day creation. Why? That was his plan. That was his will. And why is it important that we pay strict attention to that today? Because the whole key is upon it as to who the true Messiah is. And in the true Messiah, all, all can come to our Father. But there's only one way you're going to be able to trust and have faith and to know absolute because you know how careful God was to, in many cases, I believe, certainly prearranged meetings, as we're going to find one in this great book of Ruth. Now, Ruth is among those groups of uh, letters, books, that are read on the feast days. And Ruth, it just so happens, is the one that was read at Pentecost. Pentecost is that time that uh, both men and women spoke being touched by God as you read in Acts chapter 2 as you read in which they were quoting in Acts chapter 2 on Pentecost day as they spoke in those uh, uh, multi languages by that I mean every ear in the world could hear and understand with clarity it needed no interpreter in other words they were quoting the book of Job specifically the second chapter. So inasmuch as both his handmaidens and young men, the old men and women would speak that God would use, it's befitting that Ruth was read on that day being female. So uh, the Moabites, uh, many people believe because of Deuteronomy chapter 23 verse 3 that it would have been impossible for a Moabitist to have been in the genealogy of Christ and still have it remain clear, pure, because it was written in Deuteronomy 23.3 that no Moabitist could ever serve in the congregation of God, but here we have Ruth in the genealogy of Christ. How could that be? And that's why you want to pay attention. Because the... Uh, I don't really want to call it a curse. Banishment is the word. The banishment was not for women. The banishment is only for men. Therefore, don't ever let anyone feed you that business that God contradicted himself. He did not. And uh, if you pay attention to the feminine and the masculine, you'll find that 
that banishment was placed only upon the men because they certainly did not befriend Israel when they were coming out of Egypt. So uh, that makes uh, that argument null, void, and just doesn't amount to a hill of beans. And let's see, I think that's about all we need to say in relationship to this great book, other than there is one point I want you to pay strict attention to. It's kinsman redeemer. That law is brought forth whereby you recognize it, you pay attention to it, because it would be through this book, Ruth, read on Pentecost Day, through this Ruth, which would come even David's genealogy. She was a great-great-grandmother to David. And uh, I believe that's correct. And uh, leave me a little space there, maybe one great instead of two. Uh, but being the grandmother to David through which Christ would come, this book that was read on Pentecost Day, then we have the kinsman redeemer of all redeemers because Christ would become that one and for all time kinsman redeemer that you are his kin if you have faith and if you love him and he will redeem you because he paid an awesome price. Okay, groundwork having been laid, chapter one, verse one, the great book of Ruth, let's go with it. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled, now this lets you know when it was, the judges, um, and Ruth just following the book of Judges, I would have you remember that great um, Deborah who was a judge when no man would rule or prophesy or teach in Israel, a woman had to step in and take, his, take their places and led them even in battle. A great story. But I think it's befitting that I call attention to this where we are here to maybe cause some to look a little deeper into the Word of God. Okay, when the judges ruled, and there was a famine in the land, that's to say the land of Israel, and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, this was the uh, name of Bethlehem, which means house of bread through which Christ would come through this one Ruth, uh, we could say, all right, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. Uh, they went, uh, remember what Moab means of his own father, why, you know the story. We just completed Genesis, verse 2. And the name of the man was Elimelech. Uh, my God is king. My Yah is king. My El is king, I should say. And the name of his wife, Naomi, and... Um, uh, Naomi means the pleasant one, and I have no doubt that she was the pleasant one. Everybody loved Naomi, okay? And the name of his two sons, Malon, oh, Malon meaning sick, and evidently that would befall him, and Kileon, um, Ephrathites, again, an ancient name for Bethlehem. I'm sorry, yes, Bethlehem, of Bethlehem, Judah, and they came into the country of Moab and continued there. There was food and so forth, so, and they were kinsmen. So it was, verse 3. And Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. And uh, evidently this would cause her as a widow to fall on hard times at this time. Verse 4. And they, being her sons, took them wives of the women of Moab. The name of the one was Orpha. Uh, Orpha, that's just, it means fawn, like a, a deer, a baby deer in the Hebrew tongue. And the name of the other, Ruth, uh, which will simply means beauty. Ruth, and they dwell there about 10 years. So we have 10 years go by after Elimelech died, that Naomi with her sons and daughter-in-laws, verse 5, and Malon and Kileon died also, both of them. And the woman was left of her two sons and her husband. I mean, she lost them. Now, talk about hard times now. Here she's left with two daughter-in-laws, verse 6. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab, wants to go home. 
For she had heard in the country of Moab how that the Lord had visited his people in giving them bread. In other words, word certainly traveled, and this documents it, that God had blessed Israel, food was fine, and she's ready to go home. Verse 7. Wherefore she went forth out of the place where she was, and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on the way to return unto the land of Judah. And uh, naturally, being of that tribe. Verse 8. And Naomi uh, said unto her two daughters-in-law, Go return each to your mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you, as ye have dealt, dwelt uh, with the dead and with me. Those sons of mine, they're gone. And what she's doing here is she's saying, You have my blessings to return home. You need not go with me. And she continues, verse 9, The Lord grant you that you may find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. In other words, you're free to remarry. You're young. Find you a new husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voice and wept. There was, they had great affection for Naomi. There's one thing, though it isn't written, uh, I'm, I'm sure it isn't, but that everybody, everybody had great affection for this Naomi. She must have been quite a lady, quite a lady, um, that uh, everyone would love her in the way that they did. Verse 10, And they said unto her, Surely we will return with thee unto thy people. In other words, the, the loyalty is there. The 11, And Naomi said, Turn again, my daughters, why will you go with me? Question. Why would you want to? Are there yet any more sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? Question. I mean, she's past childbearing age. She doesn't even have a husband. So do you, you think I'm going to? And of course, um, a brother was to always take the widow as the law was at this time, 12. Turn again, my daughters. That means return again, my daughters. Go your way. For I am too old to have an husband. If I should say, I have hope. If I were to say, today I had hope. If I should have an husband also tonight. If I were to become impregnated tonight. And should also bear sons. Uh, 13 thought continuing would you tarry would you wait for them till they were grown question would you stay would you stay for them from having husbands nay my daughters for it grieveth me much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord is gone out against me well, she's going to find out in the very near future that the hand of God is certainly not against her, but that loves her very much. You see, the people weren't the only ones that loved her because it's obvious God loved her also. She's being honest, and she's using common sense, and she's telling them, you're both too young to go off with me, and uh, that you are free to go and to find husbands now, because you, there is no, it is not possible, all right, that I could bring more sons forth. And besides, she's saying in a way, you would be old women yourself then. 14. And they lifted up their voice and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clave unto her. Orpah went back. She went to her home. But Ruth's not about to leave. Ruth was very loyal to Naomi. 15, and she said, Ruth speaking, Behold, thy sister-in-law is gone back unto her people. I'm sorry, this is Naomi. And unto her gods. Notice the small g. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. 16, and Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee. Don't make me go. Or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go. And whither thou lodgest, I will lodge. 
Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. 17, where thou diest, I will die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. Do you know, it's an interesting thing. There is a seven fold consecra the consecration of Ruth within this. Sevenfold. Let me repeat them. The seven are, I will go, I will lodge, be my people, be my God, where you die, I die, I be buried, and do so unto me. Seven, the sevenfold consecration that she uh, gave to Naomi in all completeness. And we see the intelligence as well as the beauty of this one Ruth, verse 18. When she saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her, then she left speaking unto her. She knew, hey, you know, there's, she loves me that much, let her go. 19, so they too went until they came to Bethlehem. This is the house of bread, and don't ever forget who the bread of life is, Christ. This would be his birthplace as well. It would also be the birth place of the last son of the 12, which brought about the death of uh, the mother. And it came to pass when they were come to Bethlehem that all, listen to this, that all the city was moved about them and they said, is this Naomi? So you see, the whole city loved her. It, they didn't, she didn't just walk into town and the word passed uh, slowly or anything, she was back. No, they were joyed. 20, and she said unto them, she said unto them, Call me not Naomi. Call me Mara, for the Almighty hath dealt dwelt very bitterly with me, dealt very bitterly. In other words, don't call me pleasant, Naomi, but call me Mara, bitter, bitter. Call me bitter instead. So we can see that she, she, um, she felt bitter in a sense because she wanted to be called that. 21, I went out full, had a husband and two sons, and the Lord has brought me home again empty. Why then call uh, ye me Naomi, pleasant, seeing the Lord hath testified against me and the Almighty hath afflicted me? Well, he certainly had not because he brought, she had brought back one one of the women that would be in the direct genealogy of Messiah himself, the Son of God. Verse 22. So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabitist, her daughter-in-law with her, which returned out of the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem in the beginning of barley harvest. Barley harvest is the first grain to ripen and it's kind of called poor man's bread, all right? Wheat, of course, was uh, a rich man's bread, but barley was, barley's gonna make, if, you're, if you know anything about horticulture, barley's gonna make when nothing else does, and it's always early, and, and, um, and it makes a good staple for one's diet. But they arrived just at that time. Chapter two and verse one. And Naomi had a kinsman of her husband's a mighty man of wealth of the family of Elimelech. That would be her husband's uh, family, the husband that died, and his name was Boaz. And here enter Boaz. It means, Boaz means fleetness. And um, certainly you're gonna find that Boaz was a very good, fair man as well. Verse two. And Ruth the Moabitess said unto Naomi, Let me now go to the field and glean ears of corn after him in whose sight I shall find grace. 
And she said unto her, Go, my daughter. Now, the gleaners, in other words, it was the law of the land that after the harvest, uh, certain grains were to be left for the widows and the poor, let's say, to glean from the field after the harvest uh, had been, the reapers had passed over. They were to be left. And uh, ones that had broken over or something of that nature. Now, it was a little dangerous, though, because many times the reapers would misuse these widows as they would catch them in the field. It wasn't exactly a safe thing, and that's why she would state that I shall find grace, that she would find someone that would be good to her, that she could glean without, I mean, they were, they were even um, known to be a little mean to them, to scold them and so forth, and you'll pick up on that as we continue, verse three. So Ruth is saying, let me find some good person that I can glean in their field, and not be molested, verse three. And she went and came and gleaned in the field after the reapers, and her hap was to light on a part of the field belonging unto Boaz, who was of the kindred of Elimelech. You think that was an accident? I don't. I think God led her there. The word hap is an old Anglo-Saxon word uh, from the word happy, but it means her by chance, or she was lucky, though many people mislike the, uh, dislike the word lucky, and where God is concerned, I kind of feel the same way. I don't think there was any luck involved in it. I think God led her to that field she didn't know Boaz. She didn't know anything about that part of the country. I have no doubt that she probably prayed to the God of Israel to take her to the place that she had so described to Naomi that she would find grace and mercy there. So she ends up in her kinsman through Naomi's field. Verse 4. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem. He, he came out from the city to the field and said unto the reapers, The Lord be with you. He gave them a blessing. And they answered him, The Lord bless thee. Typical greeting in verse 5. Then said Boaz unto his servant that was set over the reapers, that's to say his boss in the field, Whose damsel is this? I have no doubt uh, the fact that she was called Ruth, and the Ruth meaning beauty, beauty, that she was a very beautiful person. And he takes note of her, spots her, verse 6. And a servant that was set over the reapers answered and said, It is the Moabitess damsel that came back with Naomi out of the country of Moab. Well, Naomi was his kinsman, all right? Uh, it is believed by some, and I'm going by my memory now, that Boaz was a nephew of Elimelech, all right? We'll just let that pass. Uh, say it's, I think that's the possibility. Verse 7, And she said, I pray you, let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came, and hath continued even from the morning until now that she tarried a little in the house. In other words, uh, there's more to this than, is, uh, than it would seem perhaps in the English. Many times where the, um, where the uh, gleaners would get in trouble would be when the others left the field to glean where maybe the gleaning, the reapers had not traveled. So to remove any possibility of her reaping rather than gleaning, when it come noon, she took time out. When they stopped, she stopped. So that her honesty was not questioned, that she was fair, she wanted to cause no uh, anxiety on their part. So she simply left off gleaning when they left off reaping so that there would be no suspicious, uh, and she had worked very hard at it. She'd been there all day up to that point. Eight, then said Boaz unto Ruth, 
as he, he wants to get acquainted. Hearest thou not, my daughter? Go not to glean in another field, neither go from thin, hence, but abide here fast by my maidens. In other words, he knew that this was a kinsman. By marriage, yes, but still a kinsman. And, you know, you stop and think about it. If you were very wealthy and you knew the dangers of a beautiful woman gleaning in other fields where she would no doubt sooner or later be abused by some um, reaper, he said, don't go anywhere else. You stay here and you stay close by my maidens. Um, verse 9. Let thine eyes be on the field that they do reap, and go thou after them. Have I not charged the young men that they shall not touch thee? And when thou art athirst, go into the vessels and drink of that which the young men have drawn. In other words, you take the liberty of drinking the water from my well, and I have instructed my young men, as long as you stay in this field gleaning, that they're not to touch you. And uh, meaning uh, they would not dare when they had received this strict an order. And I have no doubt that he might have passed the word that um, he certainly knew Naomi was back. And he certainly loved Naomi as others did. And naturally, he was partial, partial to this one because she was a kinsman. And I have no doubt that the word was passed well, and he had compassion for her that she was such an honest worker as well. And remember, what Ruth gleaned, Naomi, his kinsman, had the advantage of. Verse 10. And then she fell on her face and bowed herself to the ground and said unto him, Why have I found grace in thine eyes that thou shouldest take knowledge of me, seeing I am a stranger? Why, why would you do this for me? Um, and uh, I'm, I don't even know you. And again, though, Boaz knew her. Verse 11. And Boaz answered and said unto her, it hath fully been showed me all that thou hast done unto thy mother-in-law since the death of thine husband, and how thou hast left thy father and thy mother in the land of thy nativity, and art come unto a people which thou knewest not hither heretofore. In other words, uh, the word gets around, see. And who showed him? Perhaps the father again made certain that he heard of this brave young girl that would not depart from her mother-in-law, although her mother-in-law uh, needed her much worse than she needed the mother-in-law. In other words, she was loyal. It's called loyalty. And... Um, and Boaz, as you can see, has a great deal of compassion and common sense that he deducts this from those actions to reward her, whereby in turn he rewards his own kinsman and even by marriage, Ruth being a kinsman. It's called taking care of your own. But at the same time, I want you to see the compassion and the honesty within Boaz that he treated everyone fairly. Verse 12. The Lord recompense thy work, and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings thou art come to trust. I want you to see the three steps of repentance within that verse. I can't help it because of the fact that this was read on Pentecost, that she would be the Jenny in the, within the, one of the mothers and the genes that would bring forth Messiah, and that repentance within him washed away all sins. I don't know if, if you ever have problems knowing what it really means to repent 
whereby you are in a safe position to ask that your sins be forgiven, the three things that, that uh, were brought forward here, underline them even if you like in this second chapter, 12th verse of Ruth. They are, number one, work. Number two, reward. Number three, trust. And if you think for a moment, in other words, to, you have to work within the Father's uh, field before the reward will come and trust is the faith that you must have in Him to bring it forth for full repentance and forgiveness. We see the groundwork laying. There is so much in this little book, my dear one. And uh, some of these things I will bring out, perhaps some I will not. But uh, where I think it is necessary or is beautiful, I will. 13. Then she said, Let me find favor in thy sight, my Lord, for that thou hast comforted me, and for that thou hast spoken friendly unto thine handmaid, though I be not like unto one of thine handmaidens. You, uh, this is very difficult. The word friendly here means heart to heart. Heart to heart means you have spoken to me from the very heart to my heart. Uh, like, um, I, I don't want to say love at first sight. That would overdo it. But um, uh, eye to eye contact and she, she found much favor and gave much favor. I mean, I think she, she could not help loving this man as it will be obvious and in a way she says I'm not I'm not fit to be called one of your maidens because I'm I'm of a different um, um, I'm, I, I'm she was a Moabitist in other words and she was letting him know that but I want you to see the compassion within her as she humbled herself and that could not help but cause Boaz's heart to love her all the more because of this humbleness in her approach to him. Verse 14. And Boaz said unto her, At mealtime, come thou hither and eat of the bread and dip thy morsel in the vinegar. This was a, a bit of, of, of um, a kind of a, I don't want to say cheap wine, but a sour wine a poor man's wine with a little oil in it and uh, and it was very refreshing when one was hungry from hard work and she sat uh, beside the reapers and he reached her parched corn he now he was there whether he was participating in this meal or not it isn't written but he at least handed her parched corn which is uh, good food, which it was taken to the field because it would keep. And she did eat and was surfaced, surfaced uh, that is to say, filled and left. In other words, she had a lot left over of this parched corn. He was really taking care of her. And uh, naturally, no one said the better. Well, now, you know, it was not customary that a gleaner was invited into the camp to partake dinner with the um, uh, reapers, but the boss himself there instructed her to, again, uh, why? I think it was because of the humble way in which she approached him. He made certain he couldn't help liking and loving her. Again, I don't want to overdo the love part at this time uh, to say love at first sight, but it means they were eye-to-eye -eye and heart-to-heart -heart contact. He was pleased. 15. And when she was risen up to glean, Boaz commanded his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves, and reproach her not. Don't you dare scold her. I mean, he is really taking care of her in a way that... Uh, above and beyond duty. Uh, let, let her get over in some of the good stuff there and don't you dare. You leave a little extra for her along the way here. So we see that Boaz certainly appreciated 
I mean, the fact that she would follow the God of Israel, that she would leave her own people and travel all this way with this old woman, so to speak, which would be Naomi, whom she loved with all her heart, to care for her, she had to be a good girl, you know? Most would have said, uh, thank you, I love you very much, have a good trip back home, I'm out of here to find me a nice man, you know? But not Ruth. She was very loyal to her mother-in-law. Uh, loyalty that, um, I'm not going to say it's rare, but it was genuine, really was. And Boaz was keyed and tuned into that 100%, and he loved that fact. And he loved her honesty and her humbleness even to him, the thanksgiving she was giving him. And um, uh, he, he could not help himself nor could anyone else most likely to see someone that was that nice and that good a person. Naomi was blessed, though she may have lost her husband and two sons. She was certainly blessed to be the mother-in-law of this one Ruth. We'll pick it up in the next lecture. Hey, don't miss it. Listen a moment, won't you?